the dedication to the incomparable pair of brethren, the Grand Master of England, William Herbert, Earl of Pembroke, and Philip Herbert, Earl of Montgomery. At the time of the publication of the Shakespeare First Folio, its dedicatee was the sitting Grand Master of England, William Earl of Pembroke. The modern scholar and student could be forgiven for not knowing or being familiar with the key relationship between Francis Bacon and Grand Master William Herbert, Earl of Pembroke, and his brother Philip Herbert, Earl of Montgomery, the joint dedicatees of the Shakespeare First Folio. On account of Bacon's secret authorship of the Shakespeare First Folio and their primary status as its patrons and dedicatees, their lifelong relationships have been effectively written out of the Bacon biographical canon. The Earls of Pembroke and Montgomery do not even warrant an entry on the index of this standard single volume biography, The Troubled Life of Francis Bacon, by Professors Jardine and Stewart, all 637 pages of it. This is also the case with the more recent biography by Professor Robert P. Ellis, Francis Bacon, The Double-Edged Life of the Philosopher and Statesman. Nor is the central relationship between Bacon and the dedicatees of the Shakespeare First Folio explored in what is probably the first port of call for academics and students in the detailed life of Bacon in the Oxford Dictionary of National Biography. On the grounds that the secret and hidden relationship between Bacon and the Herberts has for 400 years been deliberately and systematically obscured in the pages of history, it is therefore necessary to provide a brief biographical account of Bacon and the two dedicatees of the Shakespeare First Folio, which for reasons that must be only all too obvious, Bacon and Shakespeare editors and scholars, those who understand its true significance, have suppressed. The relationship between the Bacons and Herberts went back generations over a period of more than 50 years to at least the very beginning of the Elizabethan reign. The grandfather of the Herbert brothers, William Herbert, 1st Earl of Pembroke, whose, whose first wife Anne was the sister of Queen Catherine Parr, served on the first Elizabethan Privy Council with Lord Keeper Sir Nicholas Bacon and his brother-in-law Sir William Cecil, both married to the Cook sisters, Lady Mildred Cook Cecil and Lady Anne Cook Bacon. This documents the beginning of the private and political connections between the family, which would eventually culminate in Bacon dedicating the Shakespeare First Folio to the Herbert brothers. Following his death in 1579, Lord Keeper Sir Nicholas Bacon was buried at St Paul's Cathedral in a grand monument befitting his status as a great Elizabethan statesman. When the father of the Herbert brothers, Henry Herbert, 2nd Earl of Pembroke, came to erect a monument for his late father in 1581, his friendship and great respect for Sir Nicholas Bacon moved him to instruct the Masons to take care that the said tomb does not exceed the breadth of the late Lord Keepers. No doubt a very respectful and thoughtful gest gesture that was greatly appreciated by his widow Lady Anne Bacon and her son Francis, who was to enjoy a hidden relationship with Henry Herbert, 2nd Earl of Pembroke, and his wife Mary Herbert, Countess of Pembroke, sister of Sir Philip Sidney and the Earl of Pembroke's men, to whom Bacon supplied a number of his early Shakespeare plays. Following his return from France after the death of his adoptive father, Sir Nicholas Bacon, the young poet and dramatist Francis Bacon went to stay with his biological father, Robert Dudley, Earl of Leicester, at Leicester House on the Strand. It was the Earl of Leicester who arranged the marriage of his niece, Mary Sidney, to Henry Herbert, 2nd Earl of Pembroke, whose union produced William and Philip Herbert, the joint dedicatees of the Shakespeare First Folio. The Earl and Countess of Pembroke and their two children live primarily at Wilton, their country estate near Salisbury, an idyllic location often visited in the early 1580s by her brother Sir Philip Sidney, with most probably on occasions his close and intimate friend Francis Bacon, with whom he spent so much time with at Leicester's ha Leicester House. 
Following the death of Sir Philip Sidney at Zutphen on the 17th of October 1586, his heartbroken sister Mary, Countess of Pembroke, retired to Wilton for two years of mourning before emerging in the 1590s as the most renowned gentlewoman, literary patron of the period. She turned Wilton House into a paradise for poets and dramatists, which attracted the likes of Samuel Daniel, Michael Drayton and Ben Jonson, and a whole host of other well-known members of the Elizabethan literati, who all benefited from her literary patronage. However, her most important relationship was with the greatest poet and dramatist of the period, Bacon, whose concealed relationship with Mary, Countess of Pembroke, has remained hidden to the present day, primarily because she was part of the secrecy surrounding the publication set forth in the name of Bacon's, his early literary mask, her brother Sir Philip Sidney and his other early literary mask, Sir Edmund Spencer, a secret relationship which extended to her, to her husband, Henry Herbert, 2nd Earl of Pembroke. In 1592, an acting company sponsored by Henry Herbert, 2nd Earl of Pembroke, performed at the Elizabethan Court, and in the following years, when the London theatres were closed by the plague, the company toured England. The tour proved a financial failure, and in 1593, Philip Henslow reported that the actors were forced to pawn their costumes to pay their debts. We know from the title pages of the quarto editions that the Pembroke's men performed the first three printed Shakespeare plays. One of two in 1594 was the anonymous A Pleasant Conceited History called The Taming of a Shrew, as it was sundry times acted by the Right Honourable the Earl of Pembroke's, his servants. As with many of the Shakespeare quartos, there is cipher evidence of its true authorship. The title page has exactly 33 Roman words. 33 is, uh, is Bacon in simple cipher. It is not known if The Taming of a Shrew was first performed by the Pembroke's men at Wilton, commissioned by his wife, Mary Countess of Pembroke, for her literary circle of poets and dramatists. But the one thing we can be sure about is the Earl and Countess of Pembroke would have had no difficulty whatsoever in discerning the allusions to the members of the Bacon family, in a comedy that would have doubtless had them rolling in the aisles. The year 1594 also saw the publication of the only known surviving quarto edition of the anonymous, the most lamentable Roman tragedy of Titus Andronicus, as it was played by the Right Honourable, the Earl of Derby, Earl of Pembroke and Earl of Essex, their servants. At the time of its writing, Bacon was residing at Gray's Inn, and the central theme of Titus Andronicus, a legal play of law, justice and revenge, is reflected in his essay of Revenge, which structures the play at every level, permeating all its symbolism, imagery and language. This Shakespeare quarto title page has 48 italic letters, and the date edition is 19, 48 and 19, 67, Francis in simple cipher. It is widely believed that the Henry VI trilogy was written during the period of the late 1580s and early 1590s, and it is likely that all three plays were part of the repertoire of the Pembroke's men. The play, known by its shorter title of Three Henry VI, was published anonymous, anonymously. The only surviving copy of it is housed at the Folger Shakespeare Library, and by implication is companion to Henry VI, also anonymously printed as the first part of the contention betwixt the two famous houses of York and Lancaster in 1594 that was originally considered a two-part play was part of its repertoire. It is also likely that the third part of the trilogy, One Henry VI, was part of the repertoire of the Pembroke's Men, which was first published much later in the 1623 first folio with the title of the first part of Henry VI. And we notice on the title page, 3 Henry VI, the quarto, also reveals a Baconian cipher. The whole page has exactly 67 words, Francis in simple cipher. Nothing is known of the activities of the Pembroke's men for the next couple of years before the company reappeared in 1597 at Francis Langley's New Swan Theatre. 
Following the opening of the theatres in the October, the Pembroke's men were again back in action after some time touring the provinces before returning to London for two performances in 1600 at the Rose under the management of Philip Henslow, who notes, My Lords of Pembroke's men began to play at the Rose and records performances of Like Unto Like and Roderick on the 28th and 29th of October. It is believed that subsequently the Pembroke's men may have merged with the Worcester's men some time before the death of their patron, the Earl of Pembroke, in 1601. Yet, however this may be, the acting company for which Bacon supplied several of his early plays was heard of no more. During the 1590s, his son, William Herbert, entered into the life of a courtier and began moving in the Bacon Essex circles in and around Essex House on the Strand, now the headquarters of the English Secret Service, overseen by Francis and Anthony Bacon, with Essex acting as a de facto foreign secretary to the Queen. The newly installed King James visited Wilton twice in 1603 and in the May he made Pembroke a gentleman of the Privy Chamber and Keeper of Clarendon Forest, and in July he succeeded his father as a Knight of the Garter. Other matters of serious moment were happening behind the scenes, with Inigo Jones being elected Grand Master of England, and William Herbert, Earl of Pembroke, appointed his Grand Warden. William's younger brother, the handsome Philip Herbert, also immediately made an impression at court and was quickly installed as chief of the royal favourites. In the Stuart reign, Philip and his brother William were prominent figures in the early Jacobean masks, as well as later Baconian Rosicrucian masks, some of them presented by Ben Jonson and Grand Master of England Inigo Jones, that lived long in the memory of those who witnessed them. This was the period of the great expansion into North America, secretly directed by Francis Bacon and his Rosicrucian Brotherhood, that was to forever change the future direction of the modern world. In 1606, the Virginia Company was formed to organise and promote the colonisation of Virginia, and shortly after the first permanent English-speaking settlement in North America was established at Jamestown in 1607, the seed which grew and evolved into the first modern constitutional and federal republic, the United States of America. The Virginia Council issued its first charter in 1606, which established a Virginia Council in England. The second charter, charter issued in 1609 lists a large number of shareholders drawn from all walks of life and listed among its 52 named members of the council were Sir Francis Bacon, Henry Risley, Earl of Southampton and William Herbert, Earl of Pembroke. A third charter in 1612 names his mother, Mary Countess of Pembroke, as a subscriber and welcomed as an additional councillor her son, Philip Herbert, Earl of Montgomery. In 1609, Thomas Thorpe published Shakespeare's sonnets with a dedication to the only begetter of these ensuing sonnets, Mr W. H., all happiness and that eternity promised by our everlasting poet leading many Shakespeare scholars to believe that the initials WH were meant for William Herbert, Earl of Pembroke. In and around the time of the publication of Shakespeare's sonnets, Bacon and his private friend William Herbert, Earl of Pembroke, were regularly attending to the business of the Virginia Company, and Bacon may well have presented him with his own personal copy, and those Shakespeare scholars who support the claim William Herbert is the WH in the dedication often cite the lines in the third sonnet as being in allusion to him and his mother, the Countess of Pembroke. Thou art thy mother's glass, and she in thee calls back the lovely April of her prime. During Christmas 1613, Bacon, at enormous, at enormous cost, was busy preparing the mask to celebrate the marriage of Robert Carr, Earl of Somerset, to Francis Howard. In front of royalty and the noble elite of the kingdom, the mask entitled The Mask of Flowers was performed on Twelfth Night, 6th of January 1614. 
Its maskers included his two private friends, William Herbert, Earl of Pembroke, and his brother, the Earl of Montgomery. With the fall of its previous occupant, Somerset, on the 23rd of December 1615, Pembroke was made Lord Chamberlain of the Royal Household, an office of enormous and wide-sweeping power and influence. He arranged all musical and dramatic entertainments, interludes, masks and the plays given at court before the King, including Bacon's Shakespeare dramas. In his role as Lord Chamberlain, Pembroke would have regularly liaised with Bacon on a personal and private level regarding books, plays and the theatre, and in Bacon's capacity as Attorney General to the King on matters of state and government business, visiting foreign ambassadors and diplomats, and when required, dramatic entertainments and plays at court. Four years earlier, in 1611, the King had appointed Pembroke to the Privy Council, and on the 9th of June 1616, Bacon was sworn in as a Privy Councillor, and the two lifelong friends worked closely together, guiding the ship of state dealing with all current issues of domestic and foreign policy under the umbrella of national security, and the well-being and peace of the realm. These matters of the Royal Households and the Privy Council, which required close and regular contact between Bacon and Pembroke, continued for the next few years before the life-changing events of Bacon's fall in 1621, which ultimately led all the way to the publication of, of the Shakespeare First Folio and its joint dedication to the incomparable pair of brethren, the Grand Master of England William Herbert, Earl of Pembroke, and Philip Herbert, Earl of Montgomery whose private and secret relationships had stretched back decades and which would, in the fullness of time, project out to all eternity. Following his fall on the 6th of June, Bacon wrote a revelatory letter written to his trusted friend, the Spanish ambassador Gondomar, in which he plainly states, in alluding to his plan for Shakespeare First Folio, that he was now going to devote himself to the instruction of the actors and the service of mankind. Your Excellency's love towards me I have found ever warm and sincere, alike in prosperity and adversity, for which I give you due thanks. But for myself, my age, my fortune, yea, my genius, to which I have hitherto done but scant justice, calls me now to retire from the stage of civil action and betake myself to letters and to the instruction of the actors themselves and the service of posterity. In the last five years of his recorded life, Bacon wrote, revised, expanded, translated and published an enormous body of his writings and works in Latin and English. This was carried out in his literary workshop at Gorhambury with the help of his good pens, among them his dear friend, the metaphysical poet George Herbert, who assisted him in translating De Augmentis Scientiarum, and the poet and dramatist Ben Jonson, who assisted Bacon in translating his essays from English into Latin, which had been previously printed and published by John and William Jaggard, who, with his son Isaac, were now in the process of printing the Shakespeare First Folio. For his love and support in translating De Augmentis Scientiarum, published within days of the Shakespeare First Folio, his Rosicrucian Freemasonic Grand Master Bacon dedicated to him with love and gratitude the translation of certain psalms into English verse. To his very good friend, Mr George Herbert. The metaphysical poet and translator George Herbert, then living with Bacon at Gorhambury while the Shakespeare First Folio was working its way through the Jaggard printing house, was the cousin of its future dedicatees William Herbert, Earl of Pembroke, and Philip Herbert, Earl of Montgomery. His two powerful cousins were great patrons of George Herbert, who received numerous religious and political benefits before, during, and after the period he was living with Bacon at Gorhambury. It 
was to his inward and secret friend, the protector of his private life and fortune, Grand Master of England William Herbert, Earl of Pembroke, and the most honest man at court, Philip Herbert, Earl of Montgomery, in gratitude for all that had passed between them, that Bacon, in the names of Hemmings and Condell, dedicated his immortal Shakespeare first folio. In the text of the first page of the dedication to the Grand Master of England, William Herbert, Earl of Pembroke, and Philip Herbert, Earl of Montgomery, there are exactly 157 words, which are Fra Rosy Cross in simple cipher. On the second page of the de dedication, there are 287 words, Fra Rosy Cross, in K cipher, the C Secret twin double seals of the Brotherhood of the Rosy Cross, otherwise known as the Rosicrucian Brotherhood. In the months following Bacon's supposed death to the world, his private secretary and Rosicrucian brother, Dr. Rawley, compiled and published a commemorative work in his honour entitled The Memori. This rare volume contains 32 Latin verses in praise of Bacon, with an introduction by Dr. Rawley. The orthodox editors and biographers of Bacon have continued to suppress and pass over the contents of this critically important work to the present day. Several of these verses portray Bacon as a secret supreme poet and dramatist of comedies and tragedies written under the pseudonym Shakespeare. As revealing as these remarkable verses already are, in his address to the reader, Dr. Rawley plainly states that he had deliberately withheld other verses from public view, consistent with his later statement in the preface to the Resuscitata, in which he stated there are some things that are not openly communicable to the public. It is obvious enough from the above statement that Rawley was privy to the secrets of the life of his Rosicrucian master, Lord Bacon, and as can be seen from these verses alone, that he knew he was the supreme poet and dramatist Shakespeare. The memoir contains a verse penned by his inward friend, the metaphysical poet George Herbert, entitled On the Death of the Peerless Francis Viscount St Alban, Baron Verulam. In the memoir, the poet and dramatist Thomas Randolph, one of the sons of Ben Jonson, editor and contributor of two verses to the Shakespeare first folio, most strikingly reveals that his close and inward friend Francis Bacon is Shakespeare. When he perceived that the arts were held by no roots, and like seeds scattered on the surface of the soil were withering away, he taught the Pegasian arts to grow, as grew the spear of Quirinus, Spear, Spearman, i.e. Shakespeare, swiftly into a laurel tree. Therefore, since he has taught the Heliconian goddesses to flourish, no lapse of ages shall dim his glory. The ardour of his noble heart could bear no longer that you, divine Minerva, Pallas Athena, the shaker of the spear, who wore a helmet which rendered her invisible, should be despised. His godlike pen restored your wonted honour and as another Apollo, leader of the nine muses presiding over the different kinds of poetry and liberal arts, dispelled the clouds that hid you. In the 1640 edition of the English version of the De Augmentis Scientarium, immediately preceding seven verses from the Memori, is a truly magnificent poem by George Herbert entitled In Honour of the Illustrious Francis Bacon from which I quote the following few lines in which he alludes to Bacon adopting different disguises or pseudonyms and one, as the Prince of Imagination in particular, Shakespeare, the sole priest of the world and human souls, perhaps the greatest accolade to Bacon Shakespeare ever written. At length we ask him, who art thou? For he walks not every day showing the same face. Knowest thou not of death? Prince of imagination or ideas, high priest of truth, sole priest of the world and human souls. It was this secret and hidden relationship between Francis Bacon and the Herbert family, which culminated in him dedicating to William and Philip Herbert the Shakespeare First Folio, the greatest Freemasonic book in the history of the world.